what is a suitable title? If you can't hear me well, kindly increase the volume of your device so that you can hear me well. Ariko, do you want to tell us something? No, sir. Uh, someone using Techno Common 15 Air, do you want to tell us something? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to derive, but it's not coming. Okay. Mm. Amanda? Um, I think it would be a graph showing the variation, a graph showing the variation of the average cyanide content of leads with edges leads. Okay, thank you, Amanda. That's one way of putting it. A graph showing the average cyanide content of a leaf. Mm, you said a graph showing, repeat. I think I missed something. A graph showing the variation of the average cyanide content of leaf with edge of leaf. Graph showing variation of Average cyanide content with edge of the leaf. Okay, do we agree with hash? Is that the only possible answer? Yes, Masi, I'm Masio. A graph showing the relationship between the average cyanide content of the leaf with the edge of the leaf. Okay. All right. What if you wanted to use the word effect? How can you state the graph? Stato. Marisa? Okay, let's have one B's hand since his hand is up. A graph, a graph showing the effect of, of the average cyanide content of a leaf with the edge of a leaf. Okay, thank you for your contribution. Now, when we are writing titles, we have two options. We can use variation of, um, or we can use effect of. Now, when we say effect of, it is always the effect of the X on the Y, okay? It's always the effect of what is on the X on the Y. And when you use variation, it is the other way around. It is the variation of Y with X. The variation of Y with X. So if we choose the variation like some of our uh, participants have said, it would be um, a graph showing the variation of the average cyanide content of a cyanogenic plant with the edge of the leaves. So here we see a situation where we are having the X variation of uh, X, sorry, the variation of Y with, with X. 
Uh, but if it comes to effect, then it would be the other way around. Probably here we would say the graph showing the effect of age on the leaf of a, of a leaf of a of a cyanogenic plant with average cyanide content of the leaf. I hope that is clear. So we need to be careful how we write our title. So when we write the title variation to be variation of y with x, but it is effect of x on y. And this is how our graph would look like. As you can see on the horizontal, please mute your mics. You're giving us feedback and it is interrupting our lesson. The next time I'm going to put some of you out of the room because you are misbehaving. I don't want to keep reminding you of what is basic. Derek Yamkama, this is your last warning. So as you can see, on our graph here, on the horizontal, we have the age of the leaf in weeks and then the average cyanide content of the leaf on the vertical. And whenever you're writing these, these uh, axes, labeling them, you must put the units for that variable. So age here is being measured in weeks. And then the average cyanide content is being measured in milligrams per 100 grams. So this information is always provided in the question. So please ensure that you always include it because if you don't, you are going to lose marks. Then the other thing that is important is how you plot. So when we are plotting, we usually uh, plot using, get something to illustrate this. We usually plot using a small dot and, uh, and a circle around it, something like this, okay? Or you simply use an X like that, okay? And then you join the points using free hand. Join the points using free hand. And the other marks are usually lost when you don't choose a good scale. Now, if you look at this graph, we did not just copy the information directly and put it on our axes. So if you look like, for example, the edge of the leaf, we have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15. We did not just get that and transplant it here. Instead, we looked for a scale whereby one centimeter represents one week. So from right here, from right here to this point, that is one centimeter. And then from here to here, this is a second centimeter. So an appropriate scale would be once horizontal axis, you write here, uh, horizontal axis. Let me do, that. So do this. So you put here horizontal axis. And then you'd say, one centimeter represents um, one week, okay? something like that. Now, there is a habit of some candidates writing one centimeter reps or use other things like equivalent or is equal to if you do such a thing, you are going to lose marks. So it's very important you write everything in full. Then you can also come to the next one, 
and also write the vertical uh, scale and here I would say vertical scale vertical okay scale of vertical axis one centimeter one centimeter again you write the word in full represents now in this case we come and look at our units and look at our scale so this is one one milligram per 100 grams okay so if you do this then you are going to earn the max for that area so i wanted to emphasize this because whenever you are given a graph for drawing just know that those are free marks for anybody who studies biology because there's no biology in the drawing of such a graph you just need to know the simple skills and follow those skills so i hope i am loud and clear uh, in case there's any question in this regard please ask before we proceed to the next thing can hear someone claiming the sound is not clear i'm sorry if your sound is not clear i would request that you raise your volume do the rest of us hear me well yes, yes sir. okay wonderful yeah. so now that there is silence it means that maybe there are no questions on this point so we are going to use this graph to answer the other questions Okay, uh, yes, Kenneth Sechijoba. Please ask your question. Sechijoba. Unmute and ask your question. What I'm asking is that. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Is it mandatory for us to begin from the zero point when we are drawing the graphs? Well, the straight answer is no. Uh, you can begin from zero based on the information provided. Sometimes beginning from zero is not a wise decision if you are going to have a big part of your graph having no values for plotting. And this may interfere with your, your scale. Okay? So you must not always begin from zero. You only begin from zero if it doesn't harm your scale, like the kind of information we have been having, we, ca we could begin from zero. But even if I'd opted not to begin from zero, the graph wouldn't be wrong. Okay. I hope I've answered you. And it is- Yes, I know so. Mm. How do I identify the independent variable and then the dependent variable? Now, the independent variable is usually a factor that affects a process. The dependent variable is a factor that changes because of another factor. Let me explain it this way. If we are looking at a process like transpiration, it's affected by many factors. 
Now, those factors that affect that process, we call them independent variables. Like, for example, temperature, light intensity, wind velocity, humidity. Those would all be independent variables. In other words, they are not changed by the transpiration. Rather, they are the ones which change the rate of transpiration. So whenever you're dealing with a graph, ask yourself, which of these two factors causes a change on the other factor? So the factor that changes, that causes a change on the other factor becomes the independent variable. And the other factor or the other variable that is changed because of another variable now becomes the dependent variable. Or simply put, the in independent variable is a causative factor. The dependent variable is the effect of the change in the other factor. I hope, Kenneth, that is clear. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, welcome. Is there any other question before we attempt the 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 the, uh, the questions on the graph yes joseph so sir can you explain to me what limiting factor is limiting factor okay i'll answer that but ne the next question should be related to what we are covering now to understand a limiting factor uh whenever we have a process that is under the control of more than one factor okay take an example of photosynthesis the rate of photosynthesis can be controlled by more than one factor mm -hmm. so think about the factors that control the rate of photosynthesis things like light intensity carbon dioxide concentration um temperature okay those are just three factors now the rate at which such a process is going to take place is determined by that one factor of the many factors that is at uh, that is nearest to its minimum or that is at its lowest concentration okay so if for example you're looking at photosynthesis if the light intensity is low but the temperature is high uh, carbon dioxide concentration is high, it means that the rate of photosynthesis is limited by the, by the light intensity because it's the factor that is nearest to minimum. Therefore, if you change it and you increase the light intensity, then the rate of photosynthesis will increase. So that's what we mean by a limiting factor. So limiting factors slow down the rate of reactions or metabolic reactions because they are at low concentration or they are at their minimum by comparison to the other controlling factors. I hope that is clear. That was Joseph. Okay. So I think... We can move on if that is out of the way. Yeah, I'm sorry if your network is not good. You may need to change your location. Keep moving around until you get a spot where you can receive us well. Okay? Otherwise, uh, we are going to move on. So we have uh, questions. And the question here is... Um, state the relationship that exists between the cyanide concentration and the edge of the leaf. Okay. The cyanide concentration and the edge of the leaf. So what relationship can we see? Okay, can see some hands are up. Marisa? Uh, 
I think the cyanide concentration decreases with increase in age of the leaf. Okay. Correct. But would we all write it the same way? Any other? Hope? Um, I could also say, um, as the age of the leaf increases, the average cyanide concentration decreases. Okay, that's also correct. Yeah, so it's you as long as you have the same idea, the answer becomes correct. Okay, so as the age of the leaf de increases, the cyanide concentrate content or concentration decreases. So we see an inverse relationship, okay, an inverse relationship between the cyanide concentration and the age of the, of the leaf. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, although the answers you gave are much better, this is just a very simplified answer, but it's better you say that as the age of the leaf increases, the cyanide concentration decreases, or vice versa, that uh, no one can even say that the younger the leaf, the higher the cyanide concentration, and the older the leaf, the lower the cyanide concentration all those carry the same meaning now in what way would this relationship be of survival value to the plant of what in what way do you think the plant benefits from this sort of relationship and if it does how does this happen yes marisa I think, okay, we know that cyanide is a poison. So, uh, I think as the leaf grows, the cells are not so, if the cyanide can survive in terms of uh, manufacturing energy and all, all that. But if a leaf is younger, even though the cyanide concentration is higher, most things are made for um, manufacturing ATP. Thank you for your contribution. But um, it wasn't quite clear. Let's have another person as well. Benish. Benish. You can see most of us are just listening. I want us to feel free to to participate. That's the only way we are going to be able to really benefit. Patricia? Yes, teacher. My, my concept is quite related to the previous presenter. How Say this relationship enables the plan to survive is that we saw that the relationship is that as the age of the leaf is increasing, the average concentration of the cyanide decreases. That means this is going to give room for increased rate of respiration. There will be ATP generation for the active processes such as active transport, the transportation of the ions. Because respiratory cyanide, I mean, cyanide is a respiratory poison. That means if it remains in high concentration in the plant, that will have inhibited respiration. There will be low ATP generation, and in turn, the active process of the plant will also be hindered. Therefore, the decreasing concentration of the cyanide with the increasing age of the leaf ensures that the plant has increased rate of respiration for ATP generation, so as to facilitate its active processes. That's my view. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Well, whereas it's true that cyanide is a metabolic poison, respiratory poison, this cyanide is not uh, everywhere in the leaf. 
Remember when we studied um, uh, cytology or cell biology, we know that some of these poisonous substances are stored in vac in in um, in and special uh, compartments where they are limited from interacting with the rest of the uh, cytoplasm. So this cyanide can still be kept there without harming the whole processes that are necessary for this process, for, for, for the life processes to take place. Okay. So um, let me share some of the things that I have. Okay. So one of them is that it will allow the plant to grow to full maturity with minimal uh, predatory interruption or herbivory interruption or pressure. Remember that plants are eaten by herbivores. So herbivores, when they eat the plant leaves, the plant will not have a chance to grow. And if there are many herbivores, the plant will die because it is over, it's being overeaten, okay, by the, by the, by the animals. So as a way of safeguarding itself from the herbivores, it mm -hmm. accumulates this poison. And when the plants are eaten by some of these animals, they get a very uh, bad discomfort in their stomachs or in their gut, and they avoid that plant. And so the plant gets a chance to grow. And so that is why we see this Please, if I'm encouraging us to mute, those who are not muting are going to be moved out of the room because you are disrupting the rest of us who are not uh, misbehaving. So I hope that point is clear. Yes, teacher, it's clear. Okay. In fact, what happens is that there are certain, certain uh, caterpillars that eat a certain plant that produces this cyanide. So the caterpillars accumulate that cyanide in their bodies and the birds fear eating them because when they eat those caterpillars, they get a stomach discomfort. And these caterpillars are usually very brightly colored. And that is one mechanism of safeguarding themselves from predation. So let's go to the next. Then it also ensures the dispersal of plants at maturity. Thus, efficient colonization of new territories. So this allows the plants in others to grow to maturity. And when they grow to maturity, then they are able to be uh, dispersed. And you know that plants get dispersed through animals eating their seeds or eating their fruits. And you notice that as this plant grows older, the amount of cyanide reduces. So at that time, the plant can be eaten. The plant, um, the plant, uh, plant fruits can be eaten and not harm the animal. And so the animal can be able to disperse these fruits to another part and ensure its colonization. However, if these plants were eaten before maturity, it means they will never have a chance to be dispersed. So this is a good way of ensuring that they mature and therefore are able to be dispersed. <coughs> then thirdly, we see it permits the harvest of fully mature or ripe crops, which increases the net yield okay increases the 
net yield. Okay, so those are the benefits of such a relationship to the plant. So then we have another question. Suggest other defense mechanisms used by plants. So how else can the plant defend itself from herbivores? Remember that herbivores are always going to are always going to try to 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 to, to, to feed on the plant. So how do they avoid this? Yes, Jonathan. Jonathan? Okay, let's have Perpetua. Yes, thank you, teacher. Perpetua. Mm. Yes, yeah, the other diversive mechanism by is by developing thorny leaves. Okay. Yes, yes, we see the cactus. Okay, yeah, that is true. So some plants have thorny leaves like the cactus to deter the herbivores. What then the other one producing hmm, the other one producing any pleasant smell. Some plants do produce some any pleasant smell that scare away predators. Yes, I can someone has also put irritating smell. Okay, let's have other people also contribute. Someone called Easy. Teacher, can you call that unpleasant smell um, pheromones? Is it pheromones? Uh, yes. Pheromones, pheromones are produced by animals in Pheromon. order to attract those of opposite species. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are the pheromones. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Kaspersky. Uh, curling of the leaves. Curling of the leaves. Uh, okay, could you throw a little more light on that? How does that help to defend the plant from animals if the leaves are curled? I have no idea. Who can build on what he has said? We have Aaron Nea. Okay, Wambi. have very sensitive leaves that that when touched by animals, they color. When touched by uh, the animal, they do what? They curl up and then prevent the animals from eating them. Okay, that's okay. Um, let's have hope. hope. Oh, you you are talking about building up on the point of curling up. I think the previous person said it, how the person was trying to talk about the mimosa, which curls up when touched by animals. That's what I had. Okay, thank you. Angel K, 
Angela, ¿qué? Yes. Are we still adding on that same point? Yes, we need more answers. Okay, I think that plants also put on stones. Okay, that one was mentioned. Okay. Okay, this is what I have. Let me see if there's something in the chat. Some open their leaves at night and close them during the day. Well, how does that protect them from being eaten? Because I think at night there may be uh, some night nocturnal herbivores. So I don't think that would really protect them per se. So we have possession of impenetrable barriers like the thick bark and waxy cuticles. So you find that the animal cannot eat uh, the plant which has a very thick bark or if the cuticle is too waxy for its digestive for its uh, digestive system to break down then we also have production of toxic metabolites such as alkaloids uh, that are poisonous or bitter to herbivores so you have heard of some plants being very bitter. Some of them are usually used as medicinal plants by humans. And so some animals cannot taste them because they are too bitter and that deters uh, them from being eaten by those herbivores, which is good for the plants. Then some of them produce antimicrobial chemicals. Antimicrobial means something that kills microbes say like bacteria okay then they may produce proteins or enzymes that fight pathogens so sometimes we have bacteria and other pathogens that try to attack and cause disease to this plant and then the plant produces these antibacterial uh, chemicals or proteins or even enzymes that will deter those pathogens from uh, uh, causing disease to this plant. Then we also see that plant parts are modified into defensive devices like one of you and several of you others have mentioned. We have thorns, spines, and we have also trichomes. So these trichomes usually produce chemicals which cause irritation to the animal. There are these plants which if they rub them on your skin, your skin will react and you get an allergic reaction. It is simply because these plants have some chemicals uh, which, which are tucked away in those trichomes. So when the trichome breaks, then that chemical rubs on your skin and causes you to have an allergic reaction. And once you get a nasty experience with such a plant, you learn to avoid it. So you find that some plants, some animals try to eat some plants and they come back when they have swollen mouth. The mouth is very swollen and very painful and therefore they avoid such a plant. And then we have what we call crypsis. Here we have sensitive plants, like one of you observed, the mimosa pudica, or what we call the touch me not plant. These ones will close their leaves. And when they close their leaves, they will look very unappetizing to the herbivores, and the herbivores will lose interest in them. And therefore, the plants will survive. And then some plants actually lose volatile chemicals that will precipitate or cause a physiological reaction that will increase concentration of these toxic compounds in the plant. And then this will be able to keep off the herbivores, similar to what I had mentioned earlier on.
And then lastly, we have what we call mutualistic associations. So these mutualistic associations, um, who can remind us what mutualistic associations are or what mutualism is? Yes, Hope. Um, mutualistic relationship or association is a relationship between two organisms in which both of them benefit. Okay, it's correct, but uh, there's something you've missed out. What has Hope left out? Uh, Bushira, Aisha, what did uh, Hope leave out in her answer? Okay, uh, let's have Marisa. Bushira is still taking her time. Uh, that is a relationship between organisms in which both of the organisms um, gain or benefit. Marisa, you have said the same thing that Hope said. So this association is between organisms of different species, okay? If you have a friend and you both help each other, it is not mutualism from the biological perspective because you all belong to the same species and we expect you to cooperate, okay? If you are not competing. But if it is between members of different species, then we call it mutualism. Is that clear? So that is a very important addition in the definition of mutualism. Remember, these associations are always between members of different species. Parasitism between members of different species. Commensalism between members of different species. Okay? Mutualism between members of different species. So let's not leave out that detail. Now, in our example here, we are seeing that there can be a mutualistic association or beneficial association between acacia plants and some ants. Now, these ants like being around the acacia. Sometimes the acacia has certain chemicals or rather compounds which the, plant, the ants depend on. And so that's why they always hang around with the, the acacia plant. And so when a, a herbivore comes to eat the acacia, it will somehow interact with these ants and the ants will feel like they are being threatened and will bite the, uh, the herbivore. And so when the herbivores get pain, they run away from that plant and that plant is saved from uh, destruction. I hope that is clear. Uh, so in that clear. chat, someone is asking what is commensalism? So what is commensalism? Who can help uh, Edgar? What is commensalism? Okay, we have uh, Perpetua. Uh, teacher, I think commensalism, an association between, between organisms of the same species, we are both organisms. <laughs> You see, the hands have remained up, meaning that people don't agree with you. Let's have easy. Um, so I think commensalism is an association between 
two different species whereby one species benefits and the other remain ne it neither benefits nor remains harmed okay that's correct so uh commensalism one of the species benefits while the other is neither harmed nor benefits can we have an example of a mean. commensal relationship a commensal association can we have one yet easy um a cow and egrets a cow and egrets how is it commensalism egrets eat the ticks on the cow while the cow the cow is surviving from the ticks that commensalism Let's have uh, Wambi. Uh, Wambi was the person who asked. Let's have Jonathan. Master, that, that same example can clarify somehow. Okay. Mm, it's like the, the ingredient the food from the cow, the, the ticks, and then. The cow neither benefits nor gain, no, no loses. No, that is mutualism. Sure. Yes. The teacher also had some question. Talk about some symbiosis. Cause, okay, we shall talk cause, about that. Let's first get this one out of the way. Let's have one more okay. contribution before I can weigh in. Uh, Kaspersky. I think the one of the examples of commensal is like this and brain on the back of it. Yeah. Mm. You uh, explain, please. How is it commensalism? Why did we Because at our level, we are expected to be able to explain okay not just state examples okay now the example you gave me of the cattle egret can be both commensalism and mutualism it depends on how you explain it the explanation you have given me is for mutualism why because the cow benefits by having uh, less ticks on it. Remember that ticks cause disease and discomfort to the cow. And then the egret benefits by obtaining food, by eating those ticks. However, if the cow is walking in the grass and as it is walking, uh, we have insects jumping out of the grass and flying about and the egret keeps eating those insects it means that is mutualism because the cow is not benefiting from the egret eating those insects but the egret is benefiting because when a big animal walks through the bush the insects start flying about from their resting places and that way we see that as commensalism I hope that distinction is clear or if we see uh, an epiphyte growing on a tree like the lichens as someone talked about it the epiphyte is not obtaining any kind of uh, rather the tree is not benefiting by the presence of the epiphyte on its back but the epiphyte is obtaining support and also exposure to sunlight and so the epiphyte benefits while the tree neither benefits nor is harmed so that is how we look at uh, commensalism now someone who was asking about symbiosis symbiosis is a broad term to mean any association between two different organisms organisms of different species so under symbiosis, we have commensalism, parasitism, 
mutualism, and what have you, okay? So all those are just examples of symbiosis. I hope that is uh, clear. You can see the chat is very busy. And uh, let's see what people are saying. Uh, hermit crab and the sea anemone. Uh-huh. So where would we put that? E. coli and human. Uh huh. Lion and hyena. And what have you? So the the most important thing is, you ask yourself, who is benefiting? If it is both, then it is mutualism, and you must clearly explain how both benefit. If it is one and the other one is harmed, then that is parasitism. If one benefits and the other neither benefits nor is harmed then it becomes commensalism okay so as you read your books you need to bear that at the back of your mind of mind okay so let's move on with our discussion so i have another data set which is going to take us for the remaining time. Uh, this data set, we are looking at the rate of transpiration of maize compared with the rate of evaporation of water from a porous pot at no meter, okay? Over a 24 hour period. And so these results were obtained. Yes, Hope, your hand is up. Excuse me, teacher. Could you please share with us the page that has the graph just for a second before we move on to this one? Or oh, you want to take some screenshots? Okay. Yes. Okay, let me do that. So you can take some screenshots. Those who are interested, it doesn't Thank take you, more than a second. Thank you so much. Welcome. So we are back to our second question. So we see the time in hours. This experiment started at seven. And then after two hours, that is at nine, a recording. At seven, they made a recording. Okay. And then at nine, they also made another recording. So it means that between seven and nine, the porous spot had actually lost 3.8 okay cubic meters of water but the maize leaves had lost 91 cubic meters of water then between 9 and 11 this is what happened so they kept doing this over the 24 hour period so you can see, started from seven and ended at seven the following day. So notice the changes in the amount of water lost in the porous pot and the changes in the amount of water lost in the maize leaf. So when we look at this information, what comments can you make? what comments can you make i'm not asking you to explain anything to just tell me what you are observing because whenever you're given such information it's important you and you look at it and try to get some i some uh some information before even you look at the question so that you can be able to uh, save time Yes, Mary Amy. 
So I think the maize, the maize leaves lost a lot of water compared to the prior sport. Okay, it seems like that is what happened throughout the experiment. We see at every instant the maize leaves are losing more water than porous spot. What other observation do we make? Okay, we have some other. Uh, Michael? Yeah, teacher, the water is more pure in the day than at night. Michael, can you repeat your answer? I said more water is lost during the day than at night. More water is lost during the day than at night. Is it the same for both the porous pot and the maize leaf? Is it yeah. something common? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's have another person. Um, okay, let's see in the chat. Uh, Nakachua says the maize leaves lose. The word should be lose, not loose. Lose a lot of water during midday. So you're saying that at a midday is when the most water was lost by the maize leaves. Baka. Baka. Yes, the plants lose a lot of water. Both the plant, the maize leaves, and the porous pod lose a lot mm. of water between the 13th hour and the 15th hour. Okay, that is when the you say the highest amount of water. Okay, you don't say a lot of water. Okay, so you say the highest amount of water is lost during the thirteenth hour, between the thirteenth and fifteenth hour. Any other observation, uh, Willie? The lowest amount of water is lost between between five to seven hours five to seven hours is that right for which of that two okay um, between five a.m and seven a.m no it is wrong there is eight at 21 23. Sure. someone is challenging yeah. you now you see we yeah, have the porous spot and the maize leaves, so you need to be specific. Or if you're talking about the same for both, then it has to be in agreement. Okay. Uh, Joseph. Yes, uh, so uh, for me, I'm seeing that people are taking the porous spot to be a plant, but it's not a plant. Mm -hmm. Not so. They are comparing maize plant which was in open space and that one which was placed in the porous plant anometer that seed mm. so okay. it's so so the porous pot is not a plant mm -hmm. is it right the porous pot tree is not a plant yes joseph Just correcting people about that. Okay. Because, yes, from where they are giving those, that analysis. So they are calling the first plant put to be a plant, but it's not a plant. It is like a machine. Okay. Yes, okay. that's it. You are correct, but at the same time, we can compare that too because we want to compare the rate of evaporation and transpiration, okay? Because both, but that's both what processes. Yes, both processes result in loss of water. But we are trying to understand, do living things lose more water than non-living things if they're exposed to uh, heat, okay, or changes in temperature? Okay, I think uh, we have all given in our contributions. So if you look carefully, you will notice that... Uh, for instance, the porous pot, 
from 7 to about uh, 15 hours, there is an increase in the amount of water lost. Okay? Then from the 15th hour to um, to the third hour, to the fifth hour of the day. Okay, if you see my cursor, the amount of water lost goes on decreasing. Okay? So, that one was an observation you could have made. Then, if we look at the maize leaves, again, we see an increase from the, the fifth, the seventh hour. Okay? From the fifth hour, actually, not even seventh hour, from the fifth hour, that's 23. No, no, actually, the increase starts from. Okay, let's start from here. From the ninth, seventh hour to the fifteenth hour, then the decrease starts from the fifteenth hour to the seventh hour. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we are not going to do a graph mm. this time. I just wanted us to look at the table thoroughly. Of course, if you ask to draw the graph, I hope we can be able to draw a proper, proper graph in this instance. And this one would be a histogram. Okay. You can use a histogram or you can use a line graph. Okay. In this case, okay, but a line graph would be better since we have the porous pot and the maize leaves. Now, we are being asked to describe and explain the rate of transpiration in maize over the study period. To describe and explain. So, this question requires us to describe. And then explain. Sometimes the questions are describe the rate of transpiration and stops there. Or at times they tell you explain the rate of transpiration. Okay? But now this one wants us to do both. That means you have to do both separately. Although nowadays they set questions that have explain and they don't give you the chance to first describe. So if they ask you to describe, this is what you would do. So we see from the 7 hours to 15 hours, the rate of transpiration increased rapidly to a maximum. We can go back and see from 7 to 15 hours. The rate of transpiration increased uh, rapidly, actually, up to here. Let me put... Uh, Annotate with so up to this point, you see here the rate of the rate of uh, transpiration increase rapidly to a maximum because they don't have any value that is higher than this value. Okay. So that's why we set to a maximum or to a peak. You can use the word a peak because shortly afterwards it starts decreasing. So we can use the word to a peak. Okay, it attains a peak at this time. Okay, then we can move on. Then we see that from 15 hours to 19 hours, the rate of transpiration decreased gradually. Unfortunately, we don't have the graph to show how gradual it was. But if you look at our values again, we'll see from 15 to 19, you see that the decrease is not so much. Okay? The decrease is not so much. But from 19, onwards the decrease is very rapid okay 
the decrease is very rapid. So we can easily say that from 19 hours to the fifth hour, there is a rapid decrease in the water lost by the maize leaves. I thought I saw someone's hand up. Yes, Sechijoba. Kenneth? Teacher, to go back to where you said that uh, it was maximum, mm. I think we should not use the word maximum because according to the information I have got yeah, from a certain mm -hmm. seminar, I was informed that we, use, we only use the word maximum when it goes to the highest and then it attains constancy. But then mm -hmm. if it is, it attains to the highest and then it drops, that is a peak, it's not a maximum. That's what mm -hmm. I just wanted to say. Okay, thank you. So, Chijoba. So, in order to avoid confusion, of course, you can call it a peak. Okay. You can call it a peak because we know a peak rises. Uh, uh, when a graph rises and falls, the highest point becomes the peak or that that point becomes a peak you can have many peaks okay like some mountains have more than one peak yes nakachua um, excuse me teacher mm. i'm seeing here from the 21st hour mm. to to the 50th hour we are mm. having the amount of water in leaves in May. oh there's this 18 somewhere 18 here sorry I have not seen this. Mm. I'm seeing this one is an, is an increase from 8 to 18. Yes, sorry, I'd missed that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, it's good people are attentive. Uh, okay, um, I think we move on. So, of course, then we can say that from the eight, uh, 23rd hour to the 7th hour, we see, no, actually not in 7th hour, to the 3rd hour, it remains constant. No, from the 23rd hour to the 3rd hour, there is an increase. Okay, yeah, to the... First hour, there's an increase. Then from the first hour to the third hour, it remains constant. But this increase is gradual, okay? This increase is gradual. If you can see my cursor, then this one, it remains constant. Then we see a gradual decrease, okay? And then we also see a gradual increase here. Now, you may wonder why they say gradual, gradual, because the difference is small compared to, say, between 2018 and 248. The difference is very big. Or between this and this, the difference is equally very big. Or between this and this, the difference is very big. So that's why I'm talking about gradual and uh, rapid. Yes, Hope. Um, teacher, for the previous one, um, well, we said it increased gradually up to our maximum. Okay, that was okay. How about here from um, where it increased from 8 to 18? Do we also say it increases gradually to like a peak or something? Or do we just leave it like that? No. What we just say we from prefer? 8? We just say from 8 to 18, okay? Just say from 8 to oh. 18, and then from 18, here we see it remains constant. constant, okay? Yeah, because this is not very outstanding for us to really uh, talk Thank about you. it, but you could say it's a lower peak, but it is, you're better off ignoring it. Okay, um, Let's you. have a... Uh, Nakachua before Kenneth comes. OK, 
Kenakachua doesn't want to talk. Let's have Kenneth. Uh, teacher, are we allowed to use more gradual or it's not allowed when describing? Uh, more gradual and the less gradual are not good. They are a bit misleading. Okay. So, so teacher, if we are describing, for us to use the word gradual and rapid, mm. So the gradual and rapid in this case are based on the change. Unfortunately, I don't have a graph. Let me see if I can annotate and we see what I want to mean. Assuming my graph was like this. Okay. And then I have something like this. And then I have something like this. Okay. And then I also have something like this. Okay. So this first part right here is rapid. Then this other part here is gradual. You get me? Yes. Because the change in the y axis is smaller compared to the change here in the y axis. Okay. Yes, please. Who is that asking? Okay, let's move on. I was asking. Who is asking? I can't see. Mastula? Teacher. That Ask. For us to, to use the word teacher. Hello. Teacher. Please ask your question. I'm hearing. So I was asking for us to use the word gradual and rapid. We first check these greatest values and then. Uh, you have a network problem, so I cannot clearly With hear describe. you. Mm -hmm. Maybe let me just chat. Yes. Angela, I think you have a problem with your network. If you can't see my screen. So what I was saying is that you look at the change in the Y axis. Okay. If it is so great compared to the others. Okay. You know, there's an element of comparison there it becomes rapid but if the change is small compared to others then becomes gradual like in this case here this is also rapid this one like this okay because it's coming from something which is rather small you see so this is also rapid okay so don't use things like more gradual or more rapid because those things will earn you no mark at all, okay? Yeah, but sometimes someone is asking me what of slow, a slow increase. Of course, slow is the opposite of rapid. It can also be allowed, but there are some better ways of putting your answer. The word gradual is preferred and the word rapid okay is is preferred to all other words so sometimes you may they may be lenient and give it to you but it is better to stick to the simpler words i'm seeing someone saying steep steep is supposed to be <clears throat> to to mean uh, rapid. rapid okay it can also be allowed okay but uh, mm. let us let us use the other more preferred words of gradual and rapid okay, okay. 
Yeah, because some of sometimes they may get you in trouble. I've had people using exponential and what have you, but some of those words are only limited to certain types of graphs. If it's not a growth curve, you don't talk about exponential. Okay, so it's better we stick to the simple, simple words. Okay, we go back to our discussion. So we see that from 7 hours 15, the rate of transmission increased rapidly to a maximum, then from uh, 15, okay, all, all attained a peak, okay, you can say it attained a peak, then from 15 to 19, the rate of transmission decreased rap gradually, then from 19 to 30, 23 hours, the rate of transmission decreased rapidly to a minimum, okay, why do we say minimum? Because shortly afterwards, it starts rising, okay? Or it remained constant. But if the graph stops there, then we can't say a minimum, okay? So we call it a minimum if there are other values after that point where the graph is either remaining constant or the graph is rising. Just like we can say to a peak, if the graph is able to start decreasing after that point okay and notice when we are describing a graph we always start by saying what is on the horizontal axis then we describe that change on the horizontal axis how it causes a change on the vertical axis so it's always good to start with the why the rather the horizontal axis like i am doing here tell us from this point to this point, the change, okay, the ch uh, there's this type of change, okay. Yes, Jonathan. Teacher, what I'm not getting clear is that now, now like here, you're saying from 23 hours to three hours, mm. is that true? Really? Yes, this is so, a 24 hour period. 23 hours means 11 o'clock in the night. All together, mm. then three hours mm. means at 3 a.m. in the morning. Is that clear? So, this experiment was done during the daytime and night time. That's why we see uh. this sort of thing. Okay, okay, so we, we don't need to like you don't need to do what. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. Okay. Teacher, I think he was trying to ask if it's okay for us to convert it to 12 hour. As long 15. as what you're converting is correct. But All right. to avoid that, to avoid the getting into trouble, treat it the way it has been. Okay? Let's not try yeah. to over hmm, to create new things because they may get us in trouble then from three hours seven hours the rate of transmission increased gradually okay then for the explanation now the explanation here you are going to give the reasons incidentally when they ask you to explain then you must describe first then give the explanation so that's why nowadays they no longer set questions that have described, then after as they tell you to explain. But if they did, then you simply first describe, then the next question you explain. Mm -hmm. my, my point. So let's do what they have asked us. So here we see that the rate of transpiration increased rapidly between seven and, it should have been and, 15 hours, or from seven to 15, hours this is a description but then the, the, the reason is when we put because and therefore we will have started the explanation so we know that from 7 a.m to about 15 hours 15 hours is 3 p.m okay we know that the sun is is up in the sky eh? and uh, yes. we know when the sun is up in the sky 
there's a high light intensity. Okay? So when there's a high light intensity, it means that there is going to be opening of the what? The stomata. Because remember the photosynthetic theory of stomata opening and closure. So the stomata have are surrounded by guard cells that have photo that 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 are capable of photosynthesis okay because they have mm. chloroplasts so the chloroplasts are going to make food and when they make food then they are going to cause the cells there to be, become turgid eh? so when they become turgid then the stomata will open and when they open of course there will be a lot of uh, water lost because the stomata are open so that's why we see a rapid rate of transpiration during those hours when the sun is brightest and also when it is hottest okay then we see that from uh, from 15 hours the light intensity okay this was it was still high and so the rate of evaporation was also still high okay but then from 15 hours we see that the sun is beginning to set the light intensity starts decreasing and then the stomata start closing gradually okay and when they close gradually and of course the heat also starts decreasing that the heat coming from the sun and this causes the rate of transpiration to gradually also reduce of course we know that at around 23 hours there's complete darkness okay and so that means that the stomata may not be able mm. to do what to open and so the rate of transpiration will be very low okay but now here they're telling us that the increase in the rate of evaporation between 23 and 7 hours is because there is gradual increase in the light intensity okay you know from as you come closer to the daybreak the light starts increasing and when it's increasing then it will favor opening of stomata and it will uh, favor uh, evaporation of water from the from the leaves then we have another question our time is re quickly running out account for the observed differences in water loss from the maize plant and the porous pot maybe i can take us back briefly you notice that we had um the porous pot clearly giving us very low readings. Why does the porous pot give us very low readings compared to the maize plant? Why do we have very low readings? Yes, hope. Um, teacher, I'm thinking it's because since in the question it's clearly maize leaves and the other one is a porous pot. So in each of these leaves, there are many stomata. So and each and in each of that storm, each of the stomata is losing water. So that means over the the water lost by the maize leaves is going to be more than the porous pot because the porous pot is just one and hence there is only one opening in which water is being lost. That's what I think. Uh, thank you, Hope. But Michael has something else to say. Michael? Okay, let's have Jonathan. Master, is it true that if I say that the plant Jonathan, we are losing you? Is losing what? 
Jonathan, type your Master. answer in the chat. We cannot hear what you're saying. I was asking. Kindly put your answer in the chat or your question in the chat. Let's have Aisha. Aisha, can you speak loudly? Okay, my idea is that in the porous spots, the, the holes are of like, they have a thick size. Aisha, we cannot hear you. You seem to be far from your mic. I'm saying that. Okay, can you hear me? I can hardly hear you. I don't know whether the rest can hear you. We are not hearing also. The porous pores. The stomach and the maize ability to adjust the stomach, the size of the stomach. Aisha, I'm going to ask you to post your answer in the chat because we are losing that important contribution. Okay, let's have Nakachwa. So she'll shy that way. Okay. Let's uh, let me share what I have. Give me, okay. Please. I think since the prayer spot has no opening as compared to the maize leaves, and the way it's losing water is by evaporation, and evaporation is slower than transpiration. That's why I think that's that's why it lost. A, a minimal amount of water as compared to the basement. What does the word porous mean when you say something is porous? Hope you want to answer that. Yes, teacher. Um, porous means it has small, small openings in which water could pass through. Mm -hmm. Yes, teacher. Then I'm, also, I'm also thinking probably because um the maize leaves for them they have stomata and the stomata are more sensitive to light intensity changes than the porous spot because the maize leaves have living cells unlike the porous spots okay i think they are in lies an answer we see that the 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 size of the opening stomata opening can increase or reduce Okay, because of the sensitivity to light. Eh? But the porous pot size neither increases nor decreases. Okay. So the fact that the maze is living and then is non living is where our differences are going to come from. So let me show you what I had prepared for us concerning that same concept. So we see that you have to first of all tell us what the difference is. You don't just assume that we can see, okay? When they ask you to account for the observed difference, tell us what the observed difference is. So the observed difference here is that the rate of transpiration of water from the maize leaves or the rate of water loss from the maize leaves is far much higher compared to the rate of evaporation from the porous port. So this will earn you a credit or mark. So the maize leaves have a much higher surface area exposed over which transpiration takes place. Whereas the porous pot has a lower surface area. I think one of you tried to talk about that, although it was not very clearly said. And then we also see that the transport mechanisms within the plant also aid the movement of water up the plant. Remember those things of root pressure, capillarity, okay? Transpiration. Remember transpiration pool and what have you. So these mechanisms aid the movement of water up the plant and consequently lost which, and when that water is lost, it must be replaced. So this mm. contributes to the high transpiration rate within the maze. Now, the porous spot, on the other hand, doesn't have any 
mechanisms that are pushing water to the surface that are causing it to be lost. You see? Then, we also see that in the porous port, evaporation is only due to heat increase. But in the plant, there are added factors such as increased tomato opening when the light intensity increases, when the root pressure is high, or when there is increase in temperature, which leads to more evaporation compared to the porous pot. Okay? And then lastly, we see that the porous pot has a higher specific heat capacity, okay, compared to the maize plant. So what does this mean? The porous pot requires a much higher temperature to cause a, high rate, a higher rate of evaporation, okay? So it must absorb so much heat for it to, to do what? To, 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 to lose the water to the atmosphere. And yet the mm. plant has a lower specific capacity. So a little heat is enough for it to cause evaporation of water from it. And as you will notice in our homes, some of our homes, we use pots to keep water. Okay? Because the pots are able to keep the water cooler than say if you put them in a plastic container which will not okay. keep the water as cold. Okay, we we'll go on. So this is my assignment for you. You can take a screenshot and you can try those questions in your spare time. So we have just a few minutes left. Uh, allow you to take screenshots and ask any questions related to what we've been covering or any other comments before we can uh, close off. Yes, Hope. Um, thank you, teacher, for the lesson. I just have one thing I want to ask. Um, when we're talking about transpiration in, in relation to light intensity, um, is it so different from when we talk about it in relation to temperature? Yes. Okay, when you talk about light intensity, the way it relates with transpiration is because light is important for photosynthesis of the guard cells, okay? So when the guard cells photosynthesize, then the products of photosynthesis allow the guard cells to absorb water from the neighboring epidermal cells and cause them to become turgid and then cause the stomata to open and which allows water to be lost. On the other hand, when you talk about temperature, of course temperature also have, is important for photosynthesis. Those uh, enzymes in the gut cells can also rely on a higher temperature to, to photosynthesize. But remember temperature, the higher the temperature, the greater the rate of evaporation. Remember when evaporation of water takes place in the spongy mesophyll, the water vapor now is able to diffuse into the, from the substomatal space into the outside of the, of the leaf. So I think you see that both of them favor a higher rate of transpiration. Okay. So in the first place, if there is a low light intensity, the stomata will not open, okay? Yeah. Although it's rare to have a low light intensity, but high temperature, okay? But it is possible to have a high light intensity, but low temperature. Because on a very cold day, the sun can be there, but when it is not hot, when okay. it is yeah i hope that is clear to you 
Yes, Sita, you've answered about the light intensity. Now, another inquiry about the temperature. When temperature usually rises so high, the stomata close because at some point the plant loses more water than it can absorb. That's when the water stress comes in. So I was just wondering, why do we say very high temperature um, increases the rate of transpiration yet when the temperature really rises the stomata is going to close and probably release of those acidic acid and could you please just clarify on that before we end okay so very high temperatures of course will cause a very high rate of transpiration now the plant tries to avoid the situation of water stress. That is a plant's way of avoiding excessive water loss. But the fact remains, when the temperatures are high, the rate of evaporation increases. Now the plant is adapted to avoid uh, a situation of water, uh, severe water stress, okay? Mm -hmm. And which will result in two wilting and what have you, you get it? Yes. by now producing abscisic acid and which yeah. results in the closure of the stomata yeah. so it's a plant's way of avoiding that and some of them if that is not good enough they will shed off their leaves okay oh, yeah. the deciduous plants or they will roll their leaves okay? okay so it's just a way of avoiding it's like if i told you that standing in the sun will cause you to sweat too much then you tell me but when it is very hot people are not in the sun yes people leave the sun because they are getting a headache they are losing too much water but if someone was to stay in the sun they would lose too much water to the extent that they would probably also die yeah, okay? yeah. Yes. so i think if there's no more other question we are going to call it a day Yes, Jonathan. Master, for me, I was asking about this graph. Can they bring a question that doesn't require to draw a graph? And they ask that, like those questions. In this last question, we had. Okay, sometimes they can draw a graph for you. Today, I have not drawn a graph for you. I gave you a table and I drew the graph for you. But sometimes I draw the graph for you, like the one that teacher Arthur showed you last time. At times, they ask you to draw the graph. Or at other times, they may even provide a table and you're supposed to analyze the information from that table. So you need to be very uh, alert. Okay. Thank you so much for time. Very nice listen. Okay, thank you. Welcome.